Um, I've been engaged in a, some really satisfying collaborative projects over the last 15 years or so, uh, in which we aim to uh, do functional genome annotation by a global mapping of genetic interactions. So this is one way that we're, as a collaborative group, exploring the genotype to phenotype relationship, which is something that I know many people in bioinformatic um, uh, uh, fields are interested in. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is I'm going to start by summarizing um, um, some work that we've done in yeast. Um, and the goal of that work was to map uh, the first full genetic interaction network for any system so that we could discover network properties that might guide us to more efficiently map genetic networks in more difficult systems, such as a human cell line. And again, uh, as you will see, uh, genetic networks tend to be very rich in functional information, so they're quite useful for um, predicting the function of uncharacterized genes, and hence we anticipate for human functional genome annotation. So my collaborators are uh, Charlie Boone, um, who I've been working with on, uh, for years on these projects. Our human genetic network uh, analysis that I'm going to describe to you is uh, done in collaboration with Jason Moffitt. And all of the work involves Chad Myers, who's at the University of Minnesota, and he's been engaged in the computational analysis of our data uh, from the very beginning of the yeast projects. And, and again, to emphasize that the general problem is how can we take um, all of this information about a variation in individual genomes and be able to use that information to predict phenotypes of, of various um, diseases or um, other relevant phenotypes in model systems. And our particular interest is in how genetic interactions influence the genotype to phenotype relationship. As I just mentioned, our approach is to lay the groundwork for a project where we might begin to look at this in human cell lines by mapping a reference genetic interaction network in the budding yeast. And the reason we chose to do that is because for many years that have been phenomenal reagents for doing systematic genetics that have been available uh, to the yeast community. Uh, the most important reagents um, that I'm going, are relevant to the talk that I'm giving are shown on the left here, and they involve mutant arrays that uh, allow us to scrutinize the phenotypes associated with any single genetic perturbation in budding yeast. So this uh, de derived from a project where a consortium of yeast labs got together and made, uh, made an effort to individually delete each yeast gene and replace it with an antibiotic resistance marker. And in doing this, they discovered that you could delete one of any 5,000 genes in the yeast genome and the cells would still survive. So we call this the non-essential gene set. And then we have a, an array of 5,000 deletion mutant alleles that we can use to look at the non-essential gene set. This experiment also defined the essential gene set in budding yeast, uh, which is the remaining 1,000 genes. And in order to study this important set, they tend to be more highly conserved across eukaryotes. We and other groups have developed a number of conditional alleles that mean we can still keep the strain alive by having a hypomorphic allele, for example, or a temperature sensitive allele, where the strain will grow at a permissive temperature, but at a restrictive temperature, the essential gene function will be lost and the cell will die. So these conditional alleles or hypomorphs let us look at in a systematic way the phenotypes associated with essential genes. And at the moment, that's not really possible to do systematically in, in, any, in any other system. So in order to manipulate these arrays and make double mutants so we could start looking at genetic interactions, uh, some years ago, a student in our lab, Amy Tong, developed a method for automating these genetics, which she called SGA or synthetic genetic array analysis. And, um, and this, this uh, uh, method uh, relies on many features of the yeast life cycle that are diagrammed on the right and I won't go into. In brief, it allows us to introduce a marked allele of any gene of interest into these sets of arrayed strains in a high throughput way. So in other words, we can start off with a query strain of interest in which we've deleted gene A that we want to explore for genetic interactions. And we take this strain through a series of replica pinning steps where we, and we uh, involve in mating to these uh, arrays. And at the end, we get a double mutant array. So now we can measure phenotypes associated with each single mutant. We can measure phenotypes associated with the double mutant and compare them to infer if we can see a genetic interaction. So that in order to emphasize what we're looking for here, a genetic interaction occurs if an allele of one gene combines with the allele of another gene to generate an unexpected double mutant phenotype. As Anastasia was just telling you, we can use any phenotype to explore genetic interactions. And she described uh, some single subcellular assays that we can use, for example, protein localization and abundance, or we can look at the morphology of subcellular compartments. And one could use that to study genetic interactions. 
but by far the simplest phenotype to measure in a systematic high throughput way is cell growth or cell fitness. This is a true for yeast and for other systems as well. In yeast, we're, uh, this phenotype is particularly amenable to large scale analysis because we can use colony size of yeast of strains grown on um, agar as a proxy for cell growth rate. So we can simply take pictures of these yeast mutant arrays or double mutant arrays, measure colony size, and then in, and ask, is there a deviation from what we expect based on the growth rate of the single mutants when we make a double mutant? So being able to quantitate this kind of colony size assay or this fitness growth-based readout is important uh, because it allows us to gather a lot of information about what me might mechanistically be going on when we're looking at genetic interactions. And I'm just illustrating that here. What we're doing is we're uh, testing whether or not we see uh, deviations from the mul multiplicative model, where the expected growth rate of the double mutant is the product of the single growth mutant phenotypes. And that's illustrated here, where we have a wild type cell with a fitness of one, and we delete gene A or gene B, we reduce uh, the fitness or the growth rate of the cell by a certain amount shown here. Uh, we reason that if A and B, these two genes, are not working together in any way, they're completely functioning biologically independently, then when you make a double mutant, you should see both phenotypes in the cell, so that the expected a double mutant phenotype would be uh, the, uh, the product of these two, so it would grow about 35% as well as wild type in this example. So that's the model we're testing. And so we can ask, do we see things that grow less well than expected based on this prediction? And this type of negative interaction includes a very interesting class called synthetic lethality, where the single mutants are alive, but the double mutant is dead. And this type of interaction has a lot of importance in, for example, cancer chemotherapeutics, where people are interested in discovering uh, vulnerabilities in cancer cells that are specific to their genetic background, and that might allow you to specifically kill cancer cells and not normal cells. Also, we can look for a very cool class of interactions called positive interactions, where the double mutant grows better than expected based on the uh, predicted fitness. And this includes a, a gene, uh, a genetic interaction class, uh, genetic suppression, which has turned out to be fairly important um, in human genetic disease, but is relatively poorly understood mechanistically. So we can get very accurate colony size measurements and extract this kind of information about uh, genetic interactions. So in a project that we finished a few years ago now, we tested most of the 6,000 genes in the yeast genome for possible pairwise genetic interactions. So basically an all by all kind of approach, testing about 18 million different gene pairs for genetic interactions. And this project identified a million uh, genetic interactions, including 550,000 negative interactions and 350,000 positive interactions, spanning most of the yeast genes. Uh, some yeast genes don't make it on the network for a variety of technical or other reasons, but nonetheless, is that we consider this a complete reference genetic interaction network. Uh, this, this, uh, the negative interactions include 10,000 synthetic lethal combinations. So this essentially defines, defines genetic background specific gene essentiality in this particular yeast strain. And this is an important consideration for many reasons, but also for in the design of, for example, synthetic uh, genomes or synthetic bio, bio process pathways, where it's useful to know what combinations of mutations might, might kill the cell. And this is not something that you should uh, uh, incorporate into your synthetic genome design. More importantly, we were interested in whether or not we were seeing any uh, interesting genetic network properties that we might be able to use to design strategies to more efficiently map genetic interactions in, in human cells. And the way we try to look for these properties is to build a genetic profile, a similarity networks, and I'll just illustrate that in the next couple of slides. So we take each query gene through this SGA approach and we get a measurement of negative and positive uh, genetic interactions. Uh, genetic interactions are rare. So for example, as shown for query gene A here, we have a couple of positive genetic interactions, some negative gen interactions, and no genetic interaction with most genes in the yeast genome. So then we can look through our data set and we can ask what other query genes share uh, genetic interactions in common with query gene A. So we can scrutinize our data set and look for what we call high correlation modules. So you can see here in this example or this toy example, these three genes actually share a lot of genetic interactions in common. So they would uh, form what we would call a high correlation module. And this other set of genes share more interactions and similar with each other than they do with uh, genes A, B, and C.
So basically we're going through the entire network, looking at these correlated genetic interaction profiles. And again, we can, il we can uh, illustrate these interactions in a number of different ways. We find that one of the most useful ways to present it is using a Cytoscape plugin uh, where we can um, weight the edge based on the degree to which the uh, uh, two mutants share genetic interactions in common. So for example, in this diagram here, gene A and B share 80% of their genetic interactions in common, so they're joined by a short edge. A also shares 30% of its interactions in common with D, so it's joined by a longer edge to that module as well. And so the idea was that if genes share a lot of genetic interactions, they might be functioning in a similar bioprocessor pathway. And so by looking for these clusters of correlated genetic interaction profiles, we might be able to make some good predictions about gene function or which genes are working together in the cell. So that's the general idea. And this is a picture of the global all by all similarity network um, uh, at a certain Pearson correlation cutoff. And I'll illustrate the functional annotation of that in the next few slides. So you can see even without any functional annotation that when we looked at these correlated genetic interaction profiles, we do indeed see clusters of, of profiles indicating that there are a number of genes that share genetic interactions more in common with each other than other genes that are making it onto this map. But of course, we want to explore the functional biological information associated with these clusters. And so there are a number of ways one could do this. Uh, we chose to use a method that was developed by Anastasia Brishnikova when she was a, a fellow at Princeton University, a Lewis Sigler fellow. And I won't go into her detail in any method, uh, in any detail, but it's published, it's called SAFE. And basically it allows us to explore regions of the network and look for enriched gene ontology or other functional information terms within these neighborhoods on the network. And so one thing Anastasia did with this network was to look for uh, um, areas of the network that were enriched for gene ontology bioprocess terms. And she found a number of enriched regions which tended to map to 17 unique clusters on the network. And I hope you can see um, on, your, on your computers that each of these bioprocess clusters corresponds to a major known bioprocess within the eukaryotic cell. So at this level of functional profile similarity, we're able to reveal uh, uh, ribosome biogenesis, RNA processing, uh, cramp transcription chromatin, nuclear cytoplasmic transport, et cetera. But we don't need to restrict ourselves to this level of correlated profile similarity. We can try to explore the network for other types of functional information that we might discover. And if we demand that the profiles are more similar than what we were looking at with the bioprocess cluster, we start to see um, protein complexes emerging um, on the network. So here, what we're, I'm showing you a, a blow up of a subregion of the network corresponding to bioprocess clusters of transcription and chromosome organization and mRNA processing. And if you zoom in here, what you can see are a number of well-characterized protein complexes involved in transcription or, or, or mRNA processing, such as the mediator, uh, various chromatin remodelators, uh, the TF2D complex, uh, mRNA cleavage factors, et cetera. So again, bear in mind here that we're looking at uh, cell growth as a readout of single and double mutants uh, grown in a single growth condition. And yet, if we look for highly correlated genetic interaction profiles, we are able to visualize most of the known protein complexes that are well characterized in yeast. What's important here too is that anything that's colored white is a, a relatively uncharacterized gene in yeast. And of course, there's way more uncharacterized genes than other systems, but they remain in yeast as well. And so we can make quite precise predictions about the functions of these genes based on their position and connectivity on the network. And we can, so for example, we could predict uh, that this particular, these particular um, unknown genes here might be involved in mRNA cleavage or mRNA capping. And then we can do experimental follow-up to see if those predictions are true. And we've done that with a number of members of the yeast community over the years and, and other people have used our data to uh, make predictions in their areas of interest as well. So I'm showing you this to illustrate the value of the functional information that's in these networks. And then if we demand a not, not very much similarity in the global inter, uh, genetic interaction profiles, we can use a protein localization standard and we can start to visualize different cellular subcompartments. So this makes some sense. It's still kind of remarkable to me that we can get this information from this double mutant fitness phenotype 
But nonetheless, the cell is the subcellular compartments of the cell, of course, reflect, as Anastasia just showed you, uh, different kinds of bioprocesses. And so we can visualize the major subcellular compartments in yeast, nucleus, nuclear periphery, et cetera, uh, by looking uh, at uh, global genetic interaction network similar profile similarities. So uh, Michael Costanzo, the research associate in our group who oversees these large genetic network projects, uh, likes to refer to this kind of analysis as a global hierarchy or model of cell function, which we argue provides us into insight into the functional wiring diagram of the cell. And we want to know, of course, if these kinds of insights um, will allow us to make some choices about how we explore genetic networks and other systems. So one thing we also did in addition to looking at this functional information was to explore a genetic interactions more in particular, for example, the positive and negative interactions to see if there were any properties associated with these interactions. And one sort of repeating module that we saw when we looked through our network was that major protein complexes, and I'm showing here um, only protein complexes that are conserved in uh, human cells, uh, tend to show genetic interactions with other protein complexes in, in quite a specific pattern. For example, here's the 19S proteasome subunit components and the genetic interactions that these components share with a number of components of other known protein complexes. And what you can see is that they, they tend to be coherent in either being all gen negative genetic interactions between the protein complexes or all positive genetic interactions. And we've done a lot of experiments to try to figure out what this means. But what this does suggest is that if this property is conserved in other systems, we should be able to, for example, test individual components of these complexes and more efficiently map the genetic network involving these, these various processes and functions. For example, a DNA replication defined by the origin recognition complex and the proteasome and its interacting protein uh, complexes uh, as sort of a protein homeostasis landmark. So that's one, one sort of structure we were interested in looking for in other systems. So we learned quite a bit in yeast and I've sort of shown you that both negative and positive interactions are highly organized. And uh, things I didn't show you are that negative interactions tend to connect functionally related genes. Some positive interactions connect genes in the same non-essential pathway and complexes, but most of them tend to reflect more general regulatory relationships like between proteostasis and cell cyclokinetics. And again, I didn't have time to show you that, but we think that these kinds of interactions are quite important and might explain why some people are more susceptible to disease than others, for example. So are these structures conserved and useful for studying genetic interaction networks in human cells? So of course, we've been able to embark on these kinds of experiments because of uh, methods for systematically perturbing gene function that are available uh, based mainly on CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And Jason Moffat in the Donnelly Center has set up a very robust platform to, for doing CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing screens in human cells. And we're sort of taking the yeast, a page from the yeast uh, playbook and basically trying to use a specific cell line and make a bunch of mutants and do screens the way we did in yeast. And there's many ways people are exploring genetic interactions in human cell lines. And this is the approach we're taking. And I think it's going to be a valuable way to map out a scaffold genetic network in this line. So we choose, chose this half-point cell line and I'm happy to discuss with people why we chose it. Um, and that's the cell line in which we're doing all of our experiments. Of course, the challenge here is obvious. Um, I've told you yeast has 6,000 genes. We were able to explore 18 million double mutants and basically that took us about 15 years. Uh, the human uh, cell has many more genes and different uh, genetic uh, isoforms, uh, um, a, a substantial number of essential genes where we do not have stable, for example, hypomorphs where we can examine them. And the, and the, the math gets quite uh, complicated and we can't possibly explore this many double mutants systematically the way we did in yeast. So it's important that we be able to choose what aspects of the genetic network to explore and try to efficiently build out a view of what might be happening in human cells. So here the general strategy was to apply rules that we learned from yeast to efficiently map genetic interactions for key human genes. So one of the most important things we learned in this regard from yeast is that there are certain features of mutant uh, genes when mutated uh, mean that they're hubs on the genetic interaction network. Essential genes are hubs on the genetic interaction network where they, uh, they uh, participate in many more positive and negative genetic interactions than non-essential genes. And we are interested in exploring that gene set um, by using various approaches to make hypomorphs in human cell lines. 
But for non-essential genes, the feature that most predicts a gene that will uh, participate in a lot of genetic interactions is single mutant fitness. So in other words, if you knock out a non-essential gene and that causes a growth defect, it's way more likely to have a lot of genetic interactions than a mutant that has no phenotype, no fitness phenotype. So that's clearly an important feature that we should uh, look at when we're uh, picking genes to uh, screen in a genetic interaction uh, project. So in order to decide uh, which genes fit these criteria, we had to make a human gene fitness catalog in the cell line that we're using for our experiments. And a lot of these experiments are overseen by Katie Chan, a research associate in uh, Jason Moffat's lab, and Mafuz Rahman, a, post, uh, a PhD student in Chad's lab, has, was doing the computational or scoring analysis. And so in this experiment, all we do is we take the wild type HAP1 parental cell line and we infect it with a guide RNA library um, from Jason's lab that targets um, every human gene with at least five guide RNAs per gene. And then we uh, grow out these cells that are infected with the lentiviral guide RNA library over many doublings. And we take samples throughout these doublings and quantify the guide RNAs at each step during the growth process using a sequencing based readout. The guides have a, a barcode that we can use for a sequencing based readout. Um, genes that when you knock them out or perturb them are essential for viability in the haploid cell line will drop out very quickly from the population in this experiment. Uh, genes that cause a fitness defect when knocked out in the HAP1 parental cell line will drop out of the mixture as we grow it out over time, but they will still persist. So they'll still be present at the endpoint of the assay. And we call these non-essential sick mutants. And those are some that we'd like to target in our genetic network analysis. And of course, we could also see genes that have no effect on fitness in the single mutant state and those we would not choose to study at least in the first past. And we've done about 40 of these wild type screens so we can get a very um, good human gene fitness catalog for this cell line. And we've defined about 1500 essential genes. That's about the same number of essential genes people see in other cell lines. Um, there seems to be a core set of essential genes emerging from these types of experiments, but different cell lines have a sort of cell line specific essential genes as well. And we see a couple thousand genes that have a significant fitness defect when you mutate them singly in this type of pooled growth experiment. So we can choose those or we can sample that uh, group uh, in our genetic network analysis. We of course have other criteria that we use to select uh, mutants. Uh, we, we have definitely focused on functionally diverse genes so that we can sample different regions of the bio, bio network and we stay away from duplicated gene classes at this point. So we, we've eliminated them from our double mutant analysis. So the experiment is, much, is designed uh, much like the SGA experiment that I've described for yeast. What we do is we first make a series of knockout query mutant cell lines where there's stable cell lines that are mutated for these query mutants of interest. So we have our wild type cell line that we know with the single mutant uh, fitness phenotypes. We make a mutation in mutant A, mutant B, mutant C, et cetera. And then we repeat this lentiviral knockout library experiment um, in each of these query mutant backgrounds and ask, uh, are there differences between the profiles of guide and RNA dropout in these different mutant backgrounds. And we might see things, for example, that cause death in the absence of mutant B, but have little effect in the wild type cell line, and those would be synthetic lethal interactions. So this is the type of experiment we're doing. And Michael Orego, I just want to note, um, uh, uh, pioneered some of this work in Jason's lab. He was very interested in metabolism. Uh, so, and he did a little metabolic network. And if you're interested, you can look in his paper that was published a couple of years ago in Nature Metabolism. So uh, as everybody knows who's doing these types of experiments, it's not, it's fairly simple to set up the experimental pipeline. The real challenge comes in scoring the data. And Max Billman, who's a, a postdoctoral fellow in Chad Meyer's lab has been working up with us throughout this project to develop a score so that we can identify positive negative genetic interactions from these screens. Uh, we froze our data set at about 220 genome-wide screens so we could start to do this analysis. And this involves about 180 unique query mutant cell lines. So that means we're looking at about 3 million double mutants and this has given us about 80,000 genetic interactions. Since we only have about 180 query mutant cell lines, of course, most of these genetic interactions are coming from the array strain side at this, at the array side at this point. But nonetheless, we can still start to build out a genetic interaction network. Max's pipeline involves uh, many uh, normalization of features uh, and, frequent, and eliminating frequent flyers, batch correction. Uh, there's many batch effects in these kinds of experiments. 
we've done guide RNA quality control, um, et cetera. So the way we display the individual screens is shown on the right here, where we have the guide RNA abundance in the HAP1 cell line on this, uh, and the guide RNA abundance um, in the knockout being explored. In most cases, there's no change in the abundance of guide RNAs throughout the experiment um, between the wild type and the mutant cell line. And then there are those that grow less well than expected in the mutant and more well than expected in the mutant. Again, we're using a multiplicative model to test for genetic interactions in these experiments. So that's a kind of, in, and then we can ask if these make biological sense. So Henry Ward, a PhD student in, um, in Chad's lab has been starting to look at these uh, genetic interaction profiles that we can get from the screens we've done so far to see if we start to see structure, structures emerging like we, we saw in yeast. And so I'm showing you here a network that Henry produced a little while ago, which involved a couple hundred queries. Now, as you'll recall, this is 200 queries by 17,000 library genes. And he's using a profile similarity matrix uh, to generate this network. And again, he was so far, uh, there's about 80,000 or so total interactions on the network. And you can see, I think even without annotating the network that like yeast, we're starting to see regions of clustered genetic interaction profile similarity on this human uh, genetic interaction network, which we found uh, quite exciting. So then we can start to annotate this network just like we did in yeast. And here's an example of using SAFE to annotate this genetic interaction network uh, for human cells. And this was done by Michael Costanzo. And, it, and he did it in a couple of ways. First, he used SAFE to annotate the network and he saw about 44 or so network clusters that were enriched for gene ontology bioprocess terms. When he looked at it manually, he realized there's a lot of overlap in those bioprocess terms. Uh, that is a particular issue with the gene ontology for human genes. And so he kind of finessed it and made 27 merged domains that again correspond to uh, many of the important bioprocesses in the eukaryotic cell. And again, this is laid out exactly the way we did in, for yeast. And you see that these, these bioprocess clusters uh, are close to each other when they're uh, functionally similar. For example, DNA replication repair and other nuclear functions like mRNA splicing and chromatin tend to organize next to each other on these networks. So this is um, encouraging to us that we're actually going to be, evaluate, be able to evaluate the human network using the same kinds of, of functional approaches we used in yeast. Again, we can start to zoom in on different regions of the network. This is sort of the nuclear network that I just mentioned and highlighted for you. And we can zoom in and start seeing that um, there are in fact, just as we saw before, uh, enrichment for protein complexes within these subregions of the network. And even though we only, we don't have, we've only done a couple of hundred screens so far, we can see components of the spliceosome clustering together, various chromatin remodelers, and uh, y SNP complex, various transcription factors clustering together on this network. And so we're hoping that again, these, these uncharacterized genes that are starting to be placed on the network, uh, we can start to use this information for functional genome annotation. And the other coherent structure that we're starting to look for is this sort of uh, all coherent positive and negative interactions between protein complexes that I mentioned uh, that we started to see in the yeast network. And we are beginning to see these structures emerging also in the human network. And this is just one example here I'm gonna show you. On the left is a network uh, involving the PTAR1 gene, which encodes a protein parental transferase, specifically a uh, subunit of uh, conserved germinal parental transferase. It's encoded by an essential gene, ECM9 in yeast. And this is just showing all the genetic interactions we've detected so far in our network with PTAR1, uh, either positive interactions with different protein complexes or negative genetic interactions with different protein complexes. And I can think, think you can see this sort of same structure emerge and we get these coherent patterns and we can see, for example, uh, lots of negative genetic interactions between PTAR and various V snares occurring here. And we knew this was also true in yeast where we look at the ECM1 gene and we see lots of negative genetic interactions between it and, uh, and, and the V snares uh, in, in yeast as well. So these kind of structures, not only is this sort of general structure the same, but the actual functional interactions seem to be the same as well. And I don't have time to go into the details, but we can start to look at these networks and think, can we make any predictions uh, based on other information as well about why we might be seeing these genetic interactions occurring? 
And because ECM9 is essential gene in yeast, we have a project where we're trying to look for bypass suppressors of all essential genes. And what we found is that ECM9 can be bypassed by mutation in an uncharacterized gene in yeast called yln 32 ozw And remarkably, we saw that PTAR in human cells interacts with the human homologs of that enzyme. And so this led us to propose a model about what uh, this palmital transferase or journal journal transferase might be doing with respect to one of the bee snares that we've been testing and have shown to be true. So this is a cool example for me anyway, where going back and forth between the yeast and human cells in these genetic networks is really allowing us to formulate hypotheses that we might not have formulated about gene function without kind of looking at these conserved network properties. So I'm hoping that as we build out these networks, a lot of these um, new predictions will emerge and be fun for the community to explore. So I'll leave you with some of the properties that we think are associated with many genetic interactions that we will uh, confirm or uh, explore more fully as we build out the network. Um, the uh, uh, pro gen uh, genes that have a lot of genetic interactions tend to be essential in more cancer cell lines. As I mentioned, they tend to have more single mutant defects in our data. They tend to be haploinsufficient based on mouse data from the Ventner Institute. They tend to encode members of protein complexes that have more protein-protein interactions. They are more often associated with disease or missense mutations in cancer cell lines. Um, so far, they tend to be more highly expressed and very, not, not vary as much as other genes in expression across different tissues. But again, these properties may be elaborated as we uh, cruise through the network and bring more bioprocesses onto the network. So I hope um, I provided you with a bit of information about how mapping reference genetic networks in isogenic systems is a really nice way for functional genome annotation and that genetic networks have properties that are useful for designing approaches to map networks in, in more complicated uh, genetic scenarios like in human cell lines. I've emphasized throughout the talk that this is a very large ongoing collaborative project that involves a number of labs at the University of Toronto, my lab, Charlie's lab, and Jason Moffat's lab. And these projects are all overseen by Michael Costanzo, a senior research associate in our group, and a close collaboration with Chad Myers and his group's uh, postdocs and students at the University of Minnesota. Many people have contributed to the human network projects and these network projects over the years. And I'm happy to answer any